I'm so glad to be with you uh, this morning. Those of you that were here last night, let's review a little bit. Is that okay? Do you remember that first question that you need to ask? Who are you, right? Who are you? And that's a question of identity. Good, good. Who are you? You need to know who you are. And the only one that can tell you, see, identity is something that is bestowed upon you. It's not something you discover. It's something that is given to you. And the only one that can give you identity is your creator, your maker. Amen? So identity is only given to you by your creator, not by books, not by sermons, not by your parents either, only by your creator. There is a process. You have to pray, Lord, please reveal to me who I am. And your maker is eager to answer that prayer. Now, the answer is a process. It's never given to you at once. I believe it's because you will not be able to bear it. So he takes time to reveal day by day, week by week, month by month, years by years. He's revealing a little bit of your identity. The second question is, where are you? And it's not a geographical question. Remember that? It's where are you in the state of your life, correct? Where are you? And we said that even though it sounds so simple or simplistic, Everybody is somewhere, right? And so where are you in your experience? Where are you in your relationship with your wife, with your husband, with your children? Where are you specifically in your intimacy, in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Where are you? Are you facing struggles, adversity? Where are you? It's a question of humility. Very good. Because a lot of us like to pretend that we are in a place that we're not. So it's a question of humility. You have to answer in humility and say, here I am, Lord. This is where I am. I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need to change this in my life. And the third question is, what do you want? And that is a question of Desire. What is in your heart? What do you desire? What do you want? And I told you that Jesus asked that question in the New Testament. Remember, disciples are following him. He turns around and says, what do you want? Remember the blind man that is shouting, son of David, son of David. You remember that? The disciples said, no, 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 no. Then they bring him to Jesus. And what does Jesus ask? What do you want? What do you want? It's not because God doesn't know. It's because your desires reveal who you are and where are you. It's a tremendous question. What do you want? Your desire. And remember, God puts desires within your heart. Somebody said this. I recently read a book and he said this. If God was to answer all your prayers... How many people will be blessed if God was to answer all your prayers? How many people will be blessed? Would it be only you? Or would it bless a lot of people? That has to do with your desires. What are you praying about? Is it an egocentric prayer? Or is it a prayer that is uh, aimed to advance in the kingdom of God? If God was to answer all your prayers, think about that. How many people will it bless? So, we're talking about this morning about faithfulness in adversity. Because the theme for this weekend is, who remembers the theme for this weekend? A stay. Why? Why do we say that? Why do we need that? Because sometimes what? We drift away, we fall apart, we go to the right, we go to the left. So we need, we need to stay the course, right? And, and why? Because we face adversity. Because Jesus prophesied this. Remember the prophecy of Jesus? The one that nobody talks about, I said. One of the greatest prophecies of Jesus Christ is, in this world, 
you will have adversity. In this world, you will have problems. In this world, you will face difficulties. But be of good faith because I have overcome the world, right? So, adversity. You know that as Christians, as Christians, uh, people will criticize you for many things. Many things. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed the world will criticize you. Your friends will criticize you. Your co-workers will criticize you. Even your relatives will criticize you. Because Christianity sometimes doesn't make sense. Have you noticed that? Sometimes it doesn't make sense, you know. For example, God is powerful. Amen? And yet, and yet sometimes what? We don't think we don't perceive as is powerful enough right there is violence in this world right there is a powerful god but there is violence in this world there is unnecessary suffering in this world right and there is unanswered prayers right and that seems to be a contradiction right you see one of one of the greatest difficulties in christianity is this you see, when we are facing adversity, we pray to a God that we believe has the power to prevent that adversity in the first place. Are you following what I'm saying? See, you're facing a problem, right? You're facing an adversity, and you pray to God because you believe He's powerful, right? He's so powerful that He could have prevented that adversity. Do you see the confusion? And so people make fun. People say, you Christians are crazy. Praying to a God that you believe is powerful, loving enough to prevent the adversity. Now you're praying for him to deliver you from the adversity. Does that even make sense? And how do you feel? Well, I want to suggest to you that you are in good company. That you're not alone. That if we are crazy, there are a lot of us that are crazy. Amen? And that the company that I'm referring is not just us in this building, but it's people throughout human history that have been loyal to God. Amen? And so, let's go. It says in Acts 12, it's just an example of what we're talking about, the, the contradictions, the craziness of being a Christian. It says... In the book of Acts 12, this is after the resurrection. This is after the ascension of Jesus Christ. This is the time of what we call the early church. It says it was about this time that King Herod, now this is the grandson of that horrible Herod, you know, that killed all the children. You remember that? This is his grandson. And this guy is not better than his grandfather, okay? And so this guy is also a politician, you know what politicians do? They want to, well, they do a lot of things, right? But, but one of the things they do is they want to please people, right? So that they can gain what? Popularity, right? They want to be very popular. They want to be accepted. You know, there are some of us that are not politicians, and yet we act as politicians, right? Because all of us want to be what? Accepted by people. We don't want people to say bad things about us. So sometimes we act, well, Herod is a great politician, and he says it was about this time that King Herod arrested some. Those some are Christians, okay? That's the company that I was telling you. You're not alone. You see, I find it very interesting when I, I hear people, you know, I, I, I came uh, to Canada to pastor in 2003, I went to Ontario, Canada, and I remember uh, I was encouraging the church, you know, to share the gospel, to advance the kingdom at work, in your workplace. And they raised their hand and said, no, pastor, not here, not in North America. I said, why? He said, they said, oh, it's against the law to share your faith at work. It's dangerous, Pastor, to share your faith at work. And I ask this question. Show me in history when it has been safe to share the gospel. Tell me, when was a time that it was safe to share the gospel? 
Even, even from the beginning, ever since the Christian church started, it has been dangerous to share the gospel. Do you know that? Forget about losing your job. These people were dying for sharing the gospel. You understand? Not, not getting in trouble with the boss. No, no, no. It was their life that was a risk. And so during this time, King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to what? It has never been easy. Brothers and sisters, it has never been safe. Young people, you are in a community, you are in an enterprise, you are in, 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 a, in a movement that has always been dangerous. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And sometimes we want to make it, right? We said, oh, no, 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 we need to fight for freedom. Well, you know, the kingdom where you belong is not from this world. And the world will always be hostile to your beliefs because you are adhering to a kingdom that is not from this world. Jesus said, if my kingdom was from this world, you know, I will call an army, I will call soldiers. It will be different, but the kingdom that you and I believe is not from this world. So do not expect sympathy from the world. Do you hear what I say? Do not expect sympathy from the world. Because everything that you do as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven contradicts the world and the interest of the world. So do not be surprised, please. I find it so hard, you know, to accept when people are like, oh, you see what, what the government is doing? What do you expect? You are not a citizen of this world. Do you understand that? You're not a citizen of this world. This is not home. That, that's some of the contradictions. That's the craziness of being a Christian. Your citizenship is in... And you know what? I'll tell you something. Your citizenship... Your citizenship in heaven does not allow for dual citizenship. Yes? You cannot be a citizen of heaven and a citizen of the world. Citizen of heaven. That's it. That's your kingdom. That's your allegiance. So, he says, intending to persecute those he apprehended. Verse 2 says, he had James... The brother of John, because Jesus had a brother named James, right? So this is not James, the brother of Jesus. This is James, the brother of John. He had James, the brother of John, not persecute, but what? Put to death with the sword. Remember what I was telling you at the beginning? It has never been, what? Saved to be a Christian. See, what Jesus is calling you is not a bed of roses. It's not, oh, things are so good now that I'm a Christian. No, things will get difficult when you become a Christian. Isn't it true? So he put James, the brother of John, to death by the sword. Now, notice the politician, right? This is Herod. Notice the politician. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, right? So he killed James, and the Jews said what? Yeah, Herod, you're so good. You're a good leader, right? When he sees that they are pleased that he killed James, he proceeded to seize who? Peter also. He says, oh, this is getting me popularity. I kill James, I like it. Oh, I want to be more popular because that's the thing, right? About popularity is never enough, right? They get popular, they want what? More popularity. And so he, said, he said, if I kill James, they like me, then I'm going to kill somebody more important. So he apprehend Peter, right? This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. So what's the intention of putting Peter in prison. What is his intention? To kill him. 
You see, that's what the book of Acts is telling you, right? When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. To do what? Not to treat him good, not to put him in a resort, to kill him. Yes? So one of the brothers died, the other is put in prison. We continue reading. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. So how many soldiers in total? Eh? Sixteen. Guarding how many people? One. What is the deal? Why is he also afraid? Why does he put 16 people to guard one? Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Why public trial? Why? Popularity, right? He wants to bring him to the people. Look what I'm going to do to Peter. He's a politician. He wants popularity, right? So Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly, what? Praying to God for him. Do you see the contradiction? Or you don't see it? Let, let, let me help you. Let me help you see the contradiction. What happened to James? What happened to James? They killed him. He's dead. Right? Now Peter's in prison. What do they do? You think they didn't pray for James? Of course they prayed for James. And now when Peter is in prison, they do the same thing. They pray. Does that, does that make sense? Do you see why the world thinks we're crazy? Right? Hey, James just died. We pray for him, but he died. Now Peter's about, well, let's pray for him. Do you see the insanity of it? I'm being sarcastic, please. You'll see. I'm asking, are they crazy? They seem to be crazy, but they're not. They're not crazy. And this is the point, all right? People will criticize you. People will say, these Adventists, these, these people are crazy, right? Young people, you should be enjoying your life. You should be going out on weekends. Why do you go to church to a youth rally? You're crazy. That's the criticism. It has always been. It's not new. It has always been the criticism of the world. Do you see the contradiction? Are they crazy? You see, Peter, by the way, spoil alert. He didn't kill Peter. All right? Yes, he wanted to kill Peter, but I'm going to tell you, he didn't kill Peter. You see, and, and, and we're going to explore, we're going to see what is Peter's perspective of things, right? Remember, yesterday I told you what is the best eyesight? 50-20, very good, 50-20. What book? Very good. Not 2020, but divine eyesight is 50-20, right? Is, is to understand the purpose of God. Is to go beyond the affairs of this world. Remember? Paradigm shift, I told you that. We're so concerned about what's going to happen in this world, right? My reputation here. I don't want people to talk bad things about me, all about this world. And yet, God is thinking what? What is God thinking? Eternity. He says, yeah, I know you're concerned about the affairs of this world, but I want you to think heavenly things. I want you to think eternally. That's my plan for you. That's what God is saying. Amen? And we need to change our, the way we think. That's a paradigm shift. We need to think like God. Amen? God is challenging us. Move beyond the affairs of this world. All you do is, no, look beyond to what I'm offering you. Andy Stanley, pastor and writer, he got in trouble for saying this. 
And I think he got in trouble because people are very fast to judge. Have you noticed that? People judge very fast, right? They, they don't wait to, you know, sometimes there are things that people say that you need to take a second look. Have you experienced that? I was reading from uh, Richard Orr. That's another writer. And he was talking about uh, the necessity, you know, to be alone. You know, you need to be alone sometimes, you know, to meditate in the Word of God, right? And, 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 and Jesus did that, and, 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 and people in the Old Testament and New Testament, they, they always took time alone to be in communion with God. And Richard Orr says uh, that there are some of us that do not like to be alone, right? Oh, no, no, I don't like to be alone. And then he says, as I was reading, he says, do you, do, do you know that uh, we don't like to be with people that we don't like? And I kept reading, and then I went, wait, 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 what does he say? <laughs> I had to go back and read it again, right? Because sometimes we don't like to be alone because we don't like us. Yeah, I had to take a second look at that. He says, you know how you don't like to be with people that you don't like? Anyway, when Andy Stanley said this, I had to look back. Because he said, that the faith of Christianity, listen, don't judge fast, that the faith of Christianity, he says, is not based on scripture. He says, it's based on an event. And people say, oh, heathen, you know, you're saying that the Bible, it's not, that's not what he was saying. He was saying that at the time the Christian church started, they didn't have the scriptures that we have. You understand? Like the New Testament was not written yet. You understand? When the, when the early church started, they didn't have what we have. So he says, the faith of Christianity was not based on the scripture. It says it was based on an event. And what was the event? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he suggests that when Christ, not yet, not yet. Go back, go back. When Christ was on the cross, he said this, everything that Jesus said was a lie. Again, let's read again. When Christ was on the cross, everything that he said was a lie. Why? There is a Savior, dead. The Savior of the world is dead, right? Everything that he promised is dead. For the disciples, everything that... But on Sunday, but the next day, what happened? resurrection right and then everything that jesus said is true amen do, do you see it if jesus had stayed dead but jesus is not dead jesus is alive you see some of us act as if jesus is dead but jesus is not dead jesus is alive you should be rejoicing on this Jesus is alive. He defeated death. You see, that's what makes the difference. That's why we Christians act like if we are crazy. But we're not. Because our faith is based on an event. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our Savior is not dead. Death is not the end. It's only the beginning. So, let's go back. This is what Peter says years later, after he was in prison. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter, yeah, by the way, scholars don't know where Peter was when he wrote this. They don't know. There's a lot of speculation, but nobody knows where he was. And I, I, will, I will show you why nobody knows where he was. But he's writing, and nobody knows because he is what? What do you think he's doing? He's hiding because he's being persecuted, all right? And so in persecution, he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, Peter, you're crazy. They're persecuting, persecuting, help me out, persecuting you. In his great mercy, he has given us what? A new birth into a living hope. That's why they think we're crazy. 
we have this hope. We hope for something better. Amen? They say, don't you see the reality? No, I don't see the reality. I have hope. I have hope. So he has given you a living hope through the... Ah, do you see how resurrection makes a difference? It's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we have what? Hope. But don't you see what you're going through? I see the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I have hope. Amen? But don't you see the struggles? See the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I have a hope. Verse 4, and into an inheritance that can never what? Ah, everything about this world will perish. But we have an inheritance that will never perish. Do you see why we need to move away from the affairs of this world and project our mind to what? Eternity. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Let's go to the next one. In all this, you greatly what? Oh, Pastor, we're going through adversity right now. Right? Don't you see the political turmoil? Don't you see the financial turmoil? Don't you see my disease? Don't you see the problems in my family? Don't you see the problems in my marriage? Don't you see... In all this, you greatly what? Rejoice. In all this is through the struggles, you rejoice. Though now for a, for a what? Not just a while, from a little while, you may have had to what? Suffer, grieve in all kinds of trials, right? But notice how Peter puts it. It's a little while compared to what? To eternity. Our mind needs to change. This is but brief. I know you feel like you've been here for 20 years. And this problem will never end, right? Peter says, it's just a little while. Not a while, a little while. Compared to what you have in store. Amen? These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith do you have hope do you have hope what is your hope based on yes it's the faith that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead it's the faith that Jesus Christ is alive that he died and he resurrected that death is not the end Of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in what? Praise, glory, and what else? Honor when Jesus Christ is ah, advantaged. You believe Jesus Christ is coming again? Amen. And that's why we act the way we act. Because Jesus is coming again. Amen. So stay course. Don't drift. Though you have not seen him. I love this passage. Because it's as if Peter is projecting himself and says, let me tell these things to the people in Tacoma. Right? In 2023. Right? Let me tell them something. Though you have not seen him, you what? You love him. Do you love Jesus Christ? Listen, do you love Jesus Christ? Listen, listen, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, when you see something beautiful, you see, you have a mountain here that you see all the time, right? Isn't that mountain beautiful? If you, if you go... If you go hiking, do you see, do you, do you like the beauty of nature? Beauty of mountain with snow, with no snow, a river, a cascade. Do you like that? Is that beautiful? When do you see a, a child with, a, with, with his mom, with her mom, is that beautiful? 
When you see something beautiful, what do you say? Praise God. That's wonderful if you say that. That's wonderful. I, I see people, when they see something beautiful, you know what they do? I didn't plan this. I know it sounds like I planned it. When they see something beautiful, what do they do? To put it where? Hmm? On Facebook or whatever platform, right? And that's it. They walk away. When, I, I want to suggest to you, when you see something beautiful, say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus, when you see something beautiful. Hmm? You wake up in the morning, and you see that great mountain, and you say, I love you, Jesus. Yes? You're looking at me like if I'm crazy. That's how you, you should see you. I'm telling you, you have to express your love to Jesus Christ. You see, if I ask, do you love Jesus? You say, yes. But how often do you tell them? So every time you see something beautiful, say, I love you, Jesus. Because he says, even though you have not seen him, you what? When something good happens, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? And when something bad happens, what are you going to say? Yes! Yes! Not only when something good happens, also when something bad happens, you're going to say, I love you, Jesus. Because you're moving away from the earthly circumstances to eternity. Amen? You love him. And even though you do not see him now, you what? You believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith. And what is that? The salvation of your souls. So, my faith is not based in my ability to explain or understand what I'm going through. You see, people say, let me explain why this happened. I understand what, you see, your faith is not based on your capacity to explain or understand because a lot of the things that happen, they're crazy, right? How are they praying for Peter when James died? They're praying to the same God, aren't they? Well, their faith is not based on that ability to explain or understand. Your faith is based on Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. The resurrection of Jesus Christ makes the difference. The resurrection of Jesus Christ makes all the difference in the world. You see, after the resurrection, everything is just details. They're just details. But the resurrection is everything. Amen? Acts 12 says, The night before Herod was to bring him to trial. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. How many soldiers he had all over? 16. But two slept right next to him, right? He was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. He's bound with two chains. And sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Do you notice that it doesn't say he uh, very tenderly touched him? It doesn't say that. What does it say? Why? Why? Yeah, but why not? Uh, he did it? He did it? Why does it say he, he struck him? Why? Because he was deeply sounded asleep. Do you understand? When you are, when, when you sleep well, they need to wake you up. Right? Where is Peter? Where is he? In jail, guarded by two soldiers, 16 all around. He has chains. Would you be sleeping? 
Will you be sleeping? Listen, sometimes if my son has not returned home at 11, I cannot sleep. Are you with me, parents? Can you imagine being in prison knowing that this guy Herod just killed James and he wants to make a show now with you, so you're about to what? To, be, to die, to be killed. Yet he is deeply asleep. To the point that the angel really has to... Peter, Peter, Peter. Why is he sleeping that way? Tell me, why is he sleeping that way? Because he has faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because everything else is just details. The affairs of this world are not important when you have faith in Jesus Christ. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains what? Fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel what? And you say, that's wonderful, amen? The question, though, is, why not to James? Why God didn't send an angel to James? Do you see the craziness of this? Hmm? Is this crazy? And I kept saying no, right? I'm just asking. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house, when he realized, hey, 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 I'm outside, right? When it dawned on him that I'm actually free, right? He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and where... What are they praying about? For him. They're praying for Peter, right? They gather together to pray. So he goes to the house. Peter knocked at the outer entrance. And a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, you know, she's like, oh, this is Peter. She was what? So overjoyed. So she believed this is Peter, right? And she's overjoyed that she forgets to answer the door, right? To open the door, right? This is so funny. People said that there is no comedy in the scripture. There is comedy in the scripture. Because this is funny, right? Right? She's a, ah, Peter. She started running without opening the door, right? She's overjoyed. She ran back without opening and exclaiming, Peter is at the door. Peter is at, what are they praying for? For Peter. For Peter's freedom, for Peter's deliverance, right? Their prayer is answered, right? Peter's at the door, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind. They told her, you're out of your mind. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. Which is a crazy belief. They thought he was dead. So, do you understand you're praying for something, but you're not expecting it to happen. Do you see the craziness of it? Do we act like that sometimes? Yeah, let's pray, let's pray. But it's not going to happen. That, you're, you're in good company. You're not the only one, right? They're praying for Peter's deliverance. And, and when the lady say, he's there, he's there. You're crazy. But we're praying for him. Yeah, but it's not going to happen. Does that make sense to you? doesn't make sense to me. But Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were what? <gasps> but you were praying for him. Yeah, but we're, 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 we, don't, we didn't believe it, right? They're astonished. Peter motioned with his hand to them to be quiet and describe how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James, that's the other, right? Not the one that was there, of course. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. Again, scholars don't know what that other place was. Why the writer didn't say where he left to? 
Why? He was being persecuted. He doesn't want to put in record where he is. You understand? Herod wants to kill him. Remember? Remember? This, the New Testament is not a, a, a cozy feeling story. It's dangerous. And he's fleeing for his life. And so he left and nobody knows where. In the morning, <laughs> in the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had come become of Peter. You, you understand? Like, this is a big event. And they're like, what in the world? How many of us? 16, uh, but there were two. Uh, yeah, forget about that. He had chains, right? And where are the chains? The chains are here, but he's not here. There was no small commotion, right? Don't you love this? I love this. There was no small commotion. After Herod, Herod had a, a thorough search made for him and did not find him. See, they did not find him, right? Where is he? We don't know. He cross-examined the guards in order that they be what? Somebody had to die, right? Somebody had to die. Again, why didn't God protect the soldiers? He protected Peter, right? Go ahead. On the appointed day, you see Herod is very embarrassed. Remember, politician. Now he looks bad. He looks bad. He goes to his summer house, his vacation house. He's embarrassed. He doesn't want to face people. But while he's in the summer house, some people say, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, you know, make a speech. We know you made a big boo-boo over there, but, you know, make a speech. So wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people, they shouted, this is the voice of God, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died. Now, this is corroborated outside of the Bible. Many historians will tell you that this guy died on that day. They will say, a strange disease, and he died. But he died on that day. But the question is, why not a month before? So that James will be what? Why not a month before? Why now? So the point is this. There are a lot of things that we don't need to understand. And, and, and you're not alone. You're in good company. Your faith is based on Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Amen? On his promises. Your faith is secure. Not on your understanding. Not on your cleverness. Not on your master degree, on your PhD. Or I have 40 years as a seven-day Adventist. I know all the prophecies. I know all the doctrines. That's not, that's not the base of your faith. The base of your faith is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ alone. But the word of God continue to what? If all your prayers were answered, how, how many people will be blessed? What are you praying for? What are your desires? Do you give up at the first sight of disappointment? I want to encourage you. See, I, I, I never use this, but you need to be here for Sunday's topic, okay? Because we're going to link all this tomorrow morning. You need to have this faith that doesn't drip away, doesn't go to the side, doesn't get discouraged because you don't understand, because you cannot explain it. The early church didn't understand what was happening. They have faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in spite of the problems, the word of God continues. We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have what? But we have what? And our hope is based on? For we believe that Jesus died and what? Ah, you see? That's what makes a difference. He died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen 
Let's live in him. God bless you. Continue to have faith in Jesus Christ. Don't rest on your understanding. Rest in Jesus Christ. God bless you.